Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from the Frontier. Thank you for stopping by. Macro thoughts, let me start with Matt O'Brien, who tweeted, The Shanghai stock market's final hour of trading is the ultimate random number generator. I think that's very accurate. Home thoughts, Lao Tzu, because of all the Chinese celebrations, came to mind. Men are born soft and supple. Dead, they are stiff and hard. Plants are born tender and pliant. Dead, they are brittle and dry. Thus, whoever is stiff and inflexible is a disciple of death. Whoever is soft and yielding is a disciple of life. The hard and stiff will be broken. The soft and supple will prevail. And then I like this as well. If you wish to be out front, then act as if you were behind. Political reflection, Xi Jinping pledged his country would never seek hegemony or expansion. It will never inflict its past suffering on any other nation. Put up a photograph of the president reviewing the armed forces at Tiananmen Square for the first time. That came off Twitter. And an interesting piece in uh, China Real Time, which is a Wall Street Journal um, uh, blog, Missile March, China Parade projects patriotism at home aims for all abroad. The greatest military parade in Chinese history sent strong messages to multiple audiences Thursday. Chinese viewers were informed that under the Chinese Communist Party's irreplaceable leadership, their nation repelled Japanese invasion, has reunified largely and is now rightfully reclaiming great power status. But amid political pomp and circumstance and patriotic pride, as citizens rallied around the red flag, was a core external military function, deterring potential foreign adversaries who might otherwise interfere with Beijing's completion of the latter two missions. That's one reason why so much advanced hardware was on display and why so much of it was missiles, some of China's most potent weapons, which could pose some of the greatest threats to the US and its allies in the unfortunate event of conflict. Comfortable as he is with wielding political power and military might, Xi doesn't want a war. Rather, he seeks to awe his potential adversaries into submission, or at least grudging acquiescence regarding Beijing's core interests and territorial claims. And you can't deter much without revealing armaments that an opponent would take seriously. All the major missiles were labelled with their English abbreviations and big letters, likely to help guarantee that their presence isn't lost on foreigners. Perhaps most dramatically, as part of an anti-ship ballistic missile formation, China displayed its DF-21D ASBN for the first time ever, announced as an assassin's mace of the parade. If properly targeted, this missile has the potential to disable ships, including U.S. carrier strike groups, the centerpiece of American sea power. No other nation has such a system. In sum, while playing to a domestic audience on the center stage, Xi also sent a clear message across the Taiwan Strait, the East China Sea, the South China Sea, and the Pacific. China has arrived as a great military power, and its interests must be taken seriously. Um, and I think that's a very fair point. And it was a fine balance, wasn't it, not to, not to sort of cow near allies into submission or allies in inverted commas. Um, People's Daily, hundreds and thousands of white doves and balloons are released, marking the end of the Grand VD Parade. Georges de Jarian tweeted this photograph, the messages behind the pageantry of today's Victory Parade in Beijing. Um, so it was a big event. Uh, it was interesting to see who went to visit. Um, um, but definitely one senses that the Chinese Communist Party at its apex is less secure than it was just a few weeks ago. It doesn't look as impregnable as it did. 
Haaretz tweeted, Senator Barbara Mikulski becomes 34th senator to back Iran deal, ensuring Obama can uphold veto. Take you back to October 2013 when I spoke about the rapprochement between President Obama and Iran's Hassan Rouhani, snapping a losing sequence in U.S.-Iranian relations that goes all the way back to the Iranian Revolution in 1979 when Ayatollah Khomeini overthrew Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, the Shah of Iran. The Shah was the second and last monarch of the House of Pahlavi, and otherwise known as the Peacock Throne. Hussein, Barack Hussein Obama, and Hassan Rouhani share the same name as did Prophet Muhammad's revered grandsons. Those who pursue the study of personal names, especially in the Islamic world, probably view this as very fortuitous. Then I quoted, A way, way, what's in a name? A name is the first and final marker of individual rights. One part, one fixed part of the ever-changing human world. A name is the most basic characteristic of our human rights. No matter how poor or how rich, all living people have a name. And it is endowed with good wishes and the expectant blessings of kindness and virtue. I was saying Hussein and Hassan are going to have to cut through a great deal of interference. That announcement by Heretz is that they've done that. In this situation, they're powerful vested interests, fully invested in the status quo. If the Pax Americana in the Middle East were a three-legged stool, with the US the most important leg, then Israel and Saudi Arabia are the other two legs of that stool. I said neither Riyadh nor Tel Aviv are aligned with President Obama's Iranian rapprochement. Saudi Arabia's king is in Washington visiting President Obama today. Mir Farrow tweeted bodies of refugees from Syria, including children like little dolls, washing up on Mediterranean beaches. And indeed, it's a tragedy. And I like this photograph from the BBC World Service, Syria to Sweden, one migrant's journey. Oscar Tinganda is in the ICC and they've already put out a flicker portrait of all events from yesterday. But I like this photograph taken at a news conference in Goma and Congo in 2009. Holger has tweeted a chart which shows you the federal funds rate versus the VIX, and it's an interesting visual. And then he also tweeted that US, US stocks closed higher. It was mostly a technology rebound yesterday. Rebounding after Tuesday's sharp declines, Dow ends up almost 300 points. Let's move to the currency markets. Um, I'll do that momentarily, let me just find the rates. Uh, a Euro 112.36 dollar index around the 96 level. Japanese yen 120.24. Swiss E.9696. The pound um, has been softening of late, 152.74. Aussie um, playing around with 70, but it now it's 0.7012. India rupee 66.255. South Korean won 1190.57. The real fresh is 12 year low 375.45. Egyptian pound 782.93. And the rand 1344.21. Put up a three month chart of the dollar index. I still think we're headed higher, but we, you know, we've got lots of curve balls out there. According to Bloomberg, there's a 6.5% chance that the euro will weaken to parity by year end, down from a probability of 18% at the end of June. Let me put up a three month chart of the euro dollar. It's become a kind of gold proxy when the markets get nervous. They go back into the, do go back into the euro. Quite interesting. Gold, I'll put up a three, six month chart of that. We're last trading at 1132.87. Um, 11.15 was what I thought would cap it. Crude oil, $46.13 all over the place. I think it's going to tank again. Emerging markets to buy property prices fell by 12.2% during last year, uh, during the past year, and that's the largest drop in the world. The decline in the 12 months through June was the biggest in 56 mainstream residential markets larger than the 12% fall in real estate prices in Ukraine, which has been hit by almost two years of protests. 
9 francs at Tuesday in a report. Prices in Dubai fell 2.8% in the second quarter. Hong Kong was the best performing residential market, with prices up 20.7%. I think the US-Iran deal will actually underpin Dubai. And as I wrote in February 2014, Dubai is the real transit state, a connection point in an interconnected century. And it does amaze me, as I tweeted some time ago, how Sheikh Mohammed magic to this 21st century metropolis out of the desert sands. Jamie McGeever, Desordem a Regresso, industrial output in Brazil plunges 8.9% year on year in July, the 17th month in a row of decline, and then Holger Brazil Real slumps to 12 year low. I've had a target for the Real of 4 for a long time, Sub Saharan Africa. Uh, there was an article in BD Live where it was saying the World Bank forecast GDP growth in Sub Saharan Africa will slow this year to 4.2%, down from an average of 6.4% during 2002 2008, and I still think that looks like a high call to me. Even after a decade of growth, Sub-Saharan Africa's manufacturing remains weak. Exports from the region more than quadrupled to $457 billion in the decade to 2011, but manufactured goods made up just $58 billion of that. How the West lost to Burundi is an article in foreign policy, uh, saying in the face of a prospect of Crimson's of being re-elected, Western governments, notably the US, France, Netherlands, and former colonial powers, Belgium and Germany, positioned themselves as stern critics of the regime and played what seems to be their strongest hand, threatening to suspend aid, which accounts for roughly half of the country's official budget, should Corinzenza go ahead with this turn, third term. Burundi's government isn't budging. Instead, the regime is betting that it can withstand isolation by moving closer to Russia and China making this the unlikely scene of a significant challenge to Western influence in Africa. If this bet pays off, it could set a precedent with geopolitical echoes well beyond the country's borders. Yet it also presents an opportunity for the US and other donors to help develop a more coherent approach to political crises across the continent. I like this photograph of a canoeist on the lake in Burundi that Laurie Simon tweeted. Reuters Africa is saying Somali Islamists warn against the immoral culture at hotels and beaches. We learnt, and this is a report carried on Yahoo News uh, via Western sources, that at least 50 were dead in the Shabab attack on an AU base, and another 50 are missing after Shabab militants overran a military camp in southern Somalia on Tuesday. Um, and it shows the still life in the Shabbat. Angola must cut back due to oil price fall. This is the central bank governor. When an individual is poor, it adjusts its consumption pattern to the new level of income that you have. We need to adjust our consumption pattern. We need to find other sources of economic growth. South African all share rallied 1.47% yesterday. It's still down 1.089% year to date. The dollar rang, let me put up a three month chart. I think we'll go back and revisit those lows above 14. Um, the Egyptian stock market, the EGX30, is down 19.89% year to date. The Nigerian all share is down 13.81% year to date. The Ghana Composite Index fell 1.99% yesterday, and it's down 6.72% year to date. From hyperinflation to deflation, no end to Zimbabwe's decline. Um, uh, Alfred Moyer sees two possible ways of moving stock from his hardware store in Mabuku Township on the eastern outskirts of Harare, selling it at a loss or giving it away. There's simply no money out there, he said in a phone interview. Doesn't matter if you've got $10 million worth of stock or $1,000 worth of stock. Either way, all you can do is sit it out and hope things will improve. Consumer prices have fallen every month since March 2014, dropping 2.8% in July from a year ago. That's a far cry from the days when prices rose an average 500 billion percent at their peak in 2008. 
the macro economy is under tremendous pressure, said Joseph Rome, a fund manager. Uh, because it's a dollarized economy, we're seeing a lot of cheap imports flood into the country, particularly from South Africa. It's hurting some of the businesses that we've invested in. More than 80 businesses have shut across the country last year, and just 39% of the country's manufacturing capacity is being used. This is according to the Confederation of Zimbabwe Industries. Brewer Delta, Zimbabwe's biggest company by market value, part owned by Sam Miller, cut the price of bottles of beer by 10% to 90 US cents in December, the second reduction in three months. Sales dropped 4.3% in the year through March, as volumes of lager beer slumped 17%. Um, uh, but clearly, uh, President Mugabe is now considering open the economy. Tanzania resumes talks for $800 million worth of loans uh, because of the weak currency. Tanzania will resume discussions for $800 million of loans from international lenders after abandoning an earlier plan as borrowing costs increased during the Greek crisis, the nation's finance minister said. Tanzania has been selling foreign currency as much as $10 million a month to support the shilling. Um, I did an interview a while back with Vimal at Bidco. Take a look at that if you're interested. And then uh, just to note here in Nairobi, another profits warning this time from V2 Ventures. The Kenya shilling back at a 2011 low 104.83. The Nairobi All Share uh, closed 0.42% lower yesterday, snapping a three session winning streak, but remaining still 3.64% above its 2015 low from 27th August. NSE 20 closed down 0.63%, down 19.26% year to date, and 1.15% above its 2015 closing low. As I said, the Nairobi All Share snapped a three session winning streak yesterday, which has seen the All Share rally 4.079%. All Share closed down 0.41%. Recovery very nascent, even fragile, remains one that could be buffeted by external factors. Um, view on the shilling, uh, yesterday it was trading at 104.65, and I said it's being buffeted by external forces as the dollar continues to grind EM and frontier currencies into the dust. The inflation print lower, which also signals an interest rate policy on an inflation basis is very restrictive and therefore it's unlikely that the central bank is going to do more on the interest rate front, hence softness in the shilling. We learned that the government of Kenya has provided a 4.2 billion shilling loan to Kenya Airways and that Afrex and Bank has approved a $200 million bridging loan. Kenya Airways firm 0.88% yesterday, Safaricom unchanged, but printing 15 at the close. Um, it has rallied 8.148% since August 26. WPP Scan Group was very strong, up 6.45%. TBS Serena rebounded 5.79%. By borrowing $20 million from Proparco to refurbish its properties, Mr. John Mohammed is surely signalling there is light at the end of the tunnel, but he damped down the timing of that rebound, saying it was more likely to happen in 2016. Uchumi up another 1.17%, put in a strong performance since the announcement that Kipitich would take over. Sent him up uh, half a percent. Jubilee Holdings, which reported very strong earnings. First half uh, profit before tax accelerated 15.8%. Uh, uh, closed 7.41% lower, but remains up 11.11% for the year. Cables was a big winner yesterday. Home Africa announced they've terminated the contract of their CEO. Mr. Jiroge Nganga, who I knew. Bamburi Cement, up 15.82% in 2015, continues to perform strong results, six shilling interim dividend. BAT Kenya continues to exhibit volatility, marked down 8.233% yesterday. BAT is minus 19.77% this year. Do remember, if you want to log on to uh, a live price feed from the Securities Exchange. You just have to register at rich.co.ke, get a password, it's all free, and then go to Rich Live, plug in your pass password, and you're connected to the stock market during trading hours. Once again, thank you kindly.